Davis is a is a Mashabi the the day of the greatest simcha in Lubavitch in connection with with the Rebbe. Uh, the the Rebbe had his day with Yud Kislev. The Friedrich the Rebbe had his day with Yud Beis Tammuz, and the Rebbe's day is Hey Tavis. But you know, I, I must say, as, as happy and as great as the day is, it's also a very sad day. Because what happened over here to a whole family, to the Rebbe's family, the whole family was destroyed from 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 this event. I don't want I don't want to go into that part. I don't want to. Uh, the tone down the uh, the simcha, but I Baruch Hashem was involved in getting back the svarim. I, I I have nothing to tell you about the court cases. I don't remember even going to, to the court. People went to court every day. Um, I I heard that uh, that uh, in the court arguments there was a. Rabbi Mentor, the Rosh Hashiva, I think went almost every day. Or, but uh, there was a whole argument there between the lawyers. The, 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 the basic of, of the case was to who do the Svarim belong? And our lawyer, who was not the woman, wanted to show that it was definitely a, li- a, a library that belonged to the Free the Kerebbe. And it was. The free together uh, gathered it, and it's also from uh, from previous uh, rabbin, and he gave it to Lubavitch, and that was based on a letter that he writes. He gave it to Lubavitch, and the question came up in court: How did he give it? You have to make a kinyan. So how, how did when he gave it? Uh, so our lawyer based uh, on, on a mission in Kiddushin. There's a mission in Kiddushin that says, Amirose l'gvoya kimsirose l'hegyadami. That when you want to give something to Hegdish, you don't have to make a, give it and make a kinyan and everything. Just by verbally saying a makdashit automatically goes over. And the lawyer from the other side, or the judge, I don't remember, asked a question about it. And Rabbi Mentley couldn't retain himself and got up from his seat and said, Efrekto Taisus Kasher. Okay, that's just uh, an introduction. There was a big problem. This uh, Einikel of the Rebbe who took the Swarim, first of all, you have to understand, he felt, according to Lushi Tosai, he felt what he's doing is right, it's entitled, it belongs to him. Why did he feel it belongs to him? Because he felt that after his grandfather passed away, there's no more Lubavitch. There's no one that could replace his grandfather. Not some people say he wanted his father to be Rebbe. That's nonsense, he didn't want his father to be Rebbe. I worked for his father, he's a great person and everything, but. Not a Rebbe, you know. But now, how do I know that he didn't consider the Rebbe a Rebbe? How do I know? I mean, uh, uh, you know, everyone seems to know it or, or say it, but you have to have some proof to it also. So I had proof to it. And my proof was the following. When his mother passed away, she was not buried in the Lubavitcher Cemetery, even though when the, in the, when the Friedrich Rebbe's mother passed away in 1942, that's when they bought the cemetery. And at that time, if you visit the oil, you all know that there's the oil, and opposite there's a place where the Rebbe's are buried. And that place where the Rebbe's are buried, the Friedrich Rebbe paid the Hebrew Kedisha for a certain amount of graves. And there's a grave there that belongs to Hanan and she was not buried there. She ended up being buried at the Munkacher Cemetery someplace in New Jersey. Was the Rebbe, have, did the Rebbe have a place? Did he buy a place for the Rebbe? The, 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 I'm talking about for the women. Ah, he bought for okay. Well, that's a separate, so we'll get, we'll get okay. that's okay. not related to us, I'm not gonna talk about okay. that now. Okay. 
So when his mother passed away, the Hever Gadisha decided to go visit him and to try to work out that she should be brought back to be buried in the place that was designated for her on the cemetery. Four people went at that time. He lived in, uh, in New Jersey. I forgot the name of the town. Right? Huh? No. No. Montclair. No. Montclair. Montclair, New Jersey. So four people went to, to visit. Uh, I was the driver. And there was also uh, the Virchel's brother, Sean Bear. He's from the Hebrew Kedisha. He's the, uh, he's the, the, uh, the, the secretary of the Hebrew Kedisha. He's not a Gaba. He's a, he's a hired employee of the Hebrew Kedisha. And then they went to Rabbi Fuchs. Do you remember the Rabbi in the Yeshiva, Rabbi Fuchs, that taught in the Yeshiva? Sure. Now, Rabbi Fuchs was a Gaba for Hebrew Kedisha. But besides being a, a Gaba for Hebrew Kedisha, he was a, a Chava. A teacher, a teacher. He was a chava. He was a chava. Uh, 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 let me let me explain it. it when when the yeshiva was in, in, in Europe in Poland, in in Atvask, so the Einikel also needed a yeshiva, but the boys in the yeshiva were a little older than him, so the Rabbi, Rabbi Fuchs was appointed to be the chava, or to, to learn with. With, with, with the Einikel. Not only that, but Rabbi Fuchs told me that they were learning Yavamas and the Friedrich Rebbe tested them on the Gemara that they learned in the Yeshiva. So he was, a, as a Gabi of Chabi Kedish, he went along, and also being a Chava. And the fourth person, his name was uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzhi Shapiro, and uh, he was also a Gabi of Chabi Kedish. So we came. I drove up to the house, knocked on the door. As soon as I knocked on the door, over there, usually in, in, a, in a shiver house, the door is open and people walk in, you know. But over there, the door was closed, and I knocked on the door, and his wife opened the door. Her name was Mina. And she gave us a little bit of Kabbalah's poem, which wasn't very uh, cordial, but we didn't pay attention to her. We came in, there's a big living room over there. He's sitting ship over there. And there were two people there. I don't know who they were, maybe neighbors or friends that came to be Menachem over. It was a husband and a wife. I even remember that the, uh, the whole time we sat quietly, we didn't say anything. And uh, the man that was visiting asked a question and it happened to be something to do with, uh, with brachas, with mesechta brachas. That's why I. That's when I opened my mouth and I, and I explained that what you're asking. And I gave the answer. Then we, we remained quiet. After the people, the two people left. So then, she came in again, and gave us again, uh, you know, something the official, to, welcome. Uh, the official welcome, <laughs> and. He told her to please go upstairs. Okay. So we're sitting there and we were discussing, you know, talking. He knew why we came and, you know, and uh, basically we're telling him, you know, it would be nice that the mother should go back to, uh, to be where, where she belongs. And, and he was arguing that um, he really has nothing to do with it. It was her decision. Uh, and she, uh, he went with her to the Munkacha to arrange it, but the Munkacha didn't want to, he also wanted to get a place next to his mother, but they didn't want to give him, because they had certain qu questions about him, but they agreed to give her, and, and, and that was it. And we were arguing back and forth and back and forth, and he made two remarks to when we were talking. One, I don't remember, which, I, I printed it, but I don't remember which was first, which was second. But at one time he said, he said to us, if your Rebbe will call me, in Yiddish, we're talking in Yiddish, I buy a Rebbe that me roofing, we could work it out. Okay. You know, and then uh, he said, uh, we're talking back and forth, you know, uh, and then he says, 
I was a fat of at Merufin. We could. The first time he said to them, I thought also he said the first time he was a fat. Well, I don't remember what you said first. The oh, second. The one time but, he did say I had ever. Yeah, one time he said I had ever. And one time he said I was a fat of at Merufin. Now, now these words are very calculated. What what he said. In other words, what he's saying is, it's your Rebbe, it's not my Rebbe. And he, 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 I don't want to go further, I mean, to, to elaborate on it, but he expressed himself with his feeling. So he felt, if that's the case, the Babish is over. The Rebbe even mentioned that he said that a good asleep upon no longer exists. It's, it's inactive. And the if that's the case, so there is, there's Yerusha. If there's a Yerusha, if there's, there's only two daughters to the, to, to be to, to heirs to, to Yashin, so now it belongs to them. So his mother has the right to give him whatever he wants from that. That, that was a, he, and that's why when he sold the Svarim, he made sure that every sale should be legal. What do I mean? Sales should be legal. If someone, you know, usually, usually I once asked someone, why do people buy Svarim? You know, and they pay huge amount of money for Svarim. I said, they're not buying it because they want to learn Dafka this one, but it's very valuable. And so somebody once told me, a dealer told me that that's a place where you can bury a lot of cash. You know, if, if you buy silver, you, you put it in the, in the closet, you know. So anyone, a guy that walks in, he'll go straight to the, to the closet, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the big uh, chest, of it, yeah, and, and he'll take the silver and walk out. But Svarim, who's going to go take them? They'll know what's safer to take. So usually the Svarim business is a, is a high cash business. He would not sell a safer for cash. You had to give him a check for the safer, and he gave you a receipt for the safer, for the, in order that if anything happens later, no one should be able to accuse him that he was laundering money. So he, he was very, very careful what he was doing. And he did it because, like I said before, he felt that it's his, okay, so that, that's just a, a general thing, a, a, a general introduction. Now, when he started taking Svarim, what happened was, he would come to visit his parents. The parents lived on the third floor of Summer Seventy, you all know the place. And in those days, that, that building of Summer Seventy was a, a building that was built by uh, a doctor, and the doctor was, his specialty was abortions. And he had a whole a little hospital there. The, 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 the first floor where you walk in, the, the ground floor, the Besmedish was a, a recovery room. And then there's a second room in back of it that was the operating room. When I learned in 770, going back in 1960. Yeah, so they still they had the tiles. It was a tiled room with a, 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 a cabinet over there with a glass, uh, where the doctor instruments would lay over there. I mean, and then the patients would come in, they would drive down the driveway, and then they turn to the right, and under the right there were four garages. Those four garages Later, when the Rebbe took it over, it became the library down there. Down there was the library. How did you get into the library? You didn't get in through, through the garages. The garages were, were closed, was like, were sealed, you know, they were, they were closed. The way you got in the building, even though it was built as a private home many years ago, had an elevator in it. And the elevator would go through the basement floor all the way up to the third floor. And when you came down from the elevator all the way down into the basement and you're getting off the elevator, if anyone remembers the Bia uh, Chomets, you had to go down over there. So you came off the elevator, you would turn to your left and there was a little alley, a little alley. You walked into that alley, to the right of the alley was, was the boiler room. And in the boiler room, there was a, a, a furnace over there where the Rebbe would come down over there and throw the chametz in there. That's how the Rebbe used to burn the chametz. If you went a few steps further past that little, the entrance to the boiler room, there was a door that faced you, and that door went into the garages. So what he would do is, he'd come to visit his mother or his father, take the elevator, go downstairs to the basement. There was a, a secretary of the Rebbe, 
by the name Chaim Lieberman, who was a, 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 a tremendous bibliographist. I mean, he wrote books on bibliography and he was recognized in all the uh, libraries he was known. And uh, he gave him access and maybe even told him what, what's, what, good, what's, what, what's, you know, what's, what's, what's more valuable, what's less valuable. And he would t take a few of the, the books over there and he'd put them into his, uh, his bag or whatever, he'd go back upstairs and then uh, he would leave. And this went on for a period of time till the librarian, his name was uh, Beda Levine, and there was also Wilhelm. They both worked on the Rebbe's yes. library. And they began to notice that there's spaces in the, in the, on the shelves. It looked a little strange. In the beginning, a few spaces, you know, no one paid attention. But when they saw that there's a number of, of spaces, so they began to become suspicious about it. They never spoke about some people that came in and took Svartam and returned it. I don't know much about that, so I'm not going to talk. And as I said, I'm not going to talk about that. They, the end was that they, they put in a camera. And the camera, of course, picked him up coming in, taking Svartam and leaving. So they knew about it. When they found out about it, so they didn't want to tell the Rebbe in the beginning, because the Rebbe would have a lot of aggravation from it. So they, um, I think they, they told the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbe, I think she knew about it, but also didn't want to tell the Rebbe. And they, first some people tried, maybe they could, uh, you know, tone it down and quiet it down. The player, at a certain interval, the Rebbe was told. And when the Rebbe was told, so the Rebbe then was quiet in the beginning, but the, when they couldn't get him to stop doing it or to return what he did, that's when the Rebbe came out publicly. That was around, approximately around New Beis Thomas that the Rebbe came out publicly. Now, okay. Now, when he got the Swarim, he didn't know what to do with the Swarim. He didn't know anything about the Swarim. You know, what their value was and everything. So he went to a auction house. In New York, there's, there's Sotheby's and there's Christie's. You know, he went to the auction house and he offered them that he has a collection of Swarim and he liked to put it up on, uh, on auction. I don't know why exactly, but they, they were a little suspicious and they, they, they turned them down. They didn't want to get it. Okay. Let, let me stop over here with this here, and, I, and let me go back to something else. It will, it will lead up to this. I have a, a cousin, a first cousin. My mother and his mother were sisters. And he, uh, interesting person, it, my uncle, to say his father was a very big collective for him. Big collective for him. He, he had one of the biggest private libraries in New York from, from Swarim. And he collected all, all kinds of Swarim. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I'll just tell you a little, to, to give you a little example. There was a time, I don't know if you're familiar with it, maybe you're familiar, but the Theological Seminary has a very big library. And the Theological Seminary once had a fire and a lot of Swarim were bought, were destroyed, and to replace things what they were damaged, they came to my uncle to purchase from him Swarim to replace. His son, his name is Eliezer Katzman. Eliezer Katzman is a, a Talmud Chacham, very knowledgeable in Swarim, not only knowledgeable in the uh, the first page, also knowledgeable, pierced the first page. See, a lot of librarians know the first page, but they don't know anything after. He's knowledgeable after that also. And uh, in fact, in, when, the, when the librarian, the head librarian of, uh, of Theological Seminary retired, they offered him to take over. And he accepted the job. Accepted the job. What happened was, his grandmother, my mother, my, my uncle's mother, 
is a sister to Rabbi Avram Kalmanovich, the one who made the Miri Yeshiva here in America. They were sisters. Their father was in love in Europe, and they, this was a brother and sister. When Avram Kalmanovich passed away, he had a son by the name of Shagamosha. Shagamosha became the Rosh Yeshiva of the Miri Yeshiva. And when he heard that my cousin took the job in theological seminary, he was out of himself. He was fuming. He came screaming, you're, 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 in, you're, you're, you're embarrassing our, our mishpacha. So he gave up the job. He gave up the job. And he ended up working for the uh, transit authority, but not, tri not a local, not driving a conductor, but he worked in the main office on J Street where they have the main office uh, for, for transit. He worked, he had a, an executive position over there in the, but he, he kept learning and he kept uh, work, doing with Svarim. He even collected Svarim and he sold Svarim. Okay, okay. Now, one time he visited me, time to time, uh, we visit each other. Uh, his brother called me this for Hanukkah, I mean, and uh, he says to me, do you know a Gerari from New Jersey? So I began to think, I say, I, I, I think, I think that Ashag, Ashag, the Mishraba Gerari, that Ashag's son work, lives in New Jersey. So I said to him, what do you got to do with, with the Gerari from New Jersey? He says, I don't know, he says, he called me at Samaisa, that some year died and left some Svarim for him, and he wanted me to, to see the Svarim. And uh, it got into, you know, Tarzan, that was the end of the conversation. This conversation took place before the Rebbe spoke about the Svarim. When the Rebbe spoke about the Svarim, so then I called him up and said, Laser, I think that you make a little mistake. I think that it, it's not a year in New Jersey that died and left some Svarim, but there's other Svarim from, from he, he, said, he said, yeah, you know, he said, I'm also becoming a little suspicious about him because he told me certain things about the Svarim, which so, something, something is strange over there. Now, how does he come to Katzman? How does he come to how, Katzman? How did he come to nephew? Yeah. yeah. He comes to Katzman because as I told you before, he went to the um, to the, uh, the auction houses. And the auction houses refused it. Now, when an auction house makes a, 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 a display, when they make an auction, they print a book with it. The book is a, it's called a, a catalog. In the catalog, there's a description of every item. So the people should know what, what we're talking about. And they have experts on everything, emotional experts on silver, experts on gold, experts on Svarim. So the experts on, on, on Hebrew bibliography are two people in, in this particular uh, auction house. One, his name is Heshi Eidelitz. You don't know the name, though. It, it, it'll come up later in conversation. But the, and the other one is Eliezer Katzman. So what the Enochle did was, he made, he did research. He found out where, you do re, where do you reach idolists and where do you reach Catherine. So he calls up idolists and he asks him, he said, do you mind if I ask you some questions about Svartim? go ahead. So he says to him, do you know about a safer called Tehillah Hashem? He says, yes, I know about it. He says, uh, could you tell me something about it? Uh, you know. I have to I have to look it up, you know. I'll look it up and I'll let you know. Then he said, do you know about a safer called uh, XYZ? I know about it. And, you know, every, every safer he asked him, he knew about it. But he said, I have to look it up. And, uh, you know, they have places where these bibliography people look them up, you know, and they give you the information. Then he says, are you available to, be, to do work for me? He said, yes. He said, what do you charge? She says, I charge $100 an hour. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'll get back to you. Then he calls up Katzman. He says to Katzman, do you know about a safer to heal Hashem? 
He says, well, it depends on which print you're talking about. The print that was printed here in this year or the print that was printed here in this year. And do you know about a safe for XYZ? Yeah, I don't know which one you're talking about. The one that was printed here or the one that was printed there, you know. He saw this guy is, you know, uh, really fluent. He really knows what's going on. So he says to him, uh, are you available to do work to, to take on? He says, yeah. He says, what do you charge? I charge $40 an hour. <laughs> no? That was a good deal right there. Right. So, you know, he's not, he's not a fool. The, the angel's not a fool. I mean, he may, he may have done wrong things, but uh, a fool he isn't. So he hired him. He hired him, and he made up with him two things. He made up with him one thing was that I will uh, pay you for every work you do. Like, you know, you have to make me, uh, I don't know, to, to, to get to... to, to to make a list and to, to evaluate this for them and to give me an idea what the, what, what the prices we're talking about. But I'll pay you the $40 an hour. And if you sell any of the sort of for me, you'll get a 5% commission. It's only gay to, to the whole story. I mean, but the, okay. Now, so now already Katzman is working for him and I have the connection to Katzman. So um, I found out that there's a very, very big problem. What was a very, very big problem? The man that ran the library for the Rebbe, his name was, as I told you before, was Chaim Lieberman. Chaim Lieberman had that whole library on his head. He knew where every cipher was in the library, but there was no list of the Swarim. There was no catalog of the Swarim. So all they knew now is that there's spaces in the library that are missing. empty, that are missing. But what was taken, nobody knew. So I asked my cousin if he has a list of the Swarim. Said, yeah, he has a list. Of, uh, the Anikul gave him a list. He has a list. I said, listen, maybe you'll do me a favor and give me the list. We're in the blind over here. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's missing, what to look for. He says, I can't do it. Why can't I do it? He says to me, because I, uh, I'm working for him. And if he ever sees the list that you have, and this is the only list that there is, so then I'll know it came from me. That's like a, a breach of uh, a, 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 a breach of a confidence, you know, for me to give you the list. So I, I came up with a brainstorm. I don't know how I got the the brainstorm, but I came up with a brainstorm. What was the brainstorm? I said, listen, Lisa, I have an Asa. I appreciate that you can't give me the list. I'm not gonna press you, I'm not gonna ask you, and I don't want to cause you any problem. However, why can't I come down to your office on J Street in the Transit Authority, give me a desk, a table to sit over there, and I will rewrite the whole list that you have by hand, in but order. in a different order. He says, good, I agree, that, that, I, that I could do. So I came to his office on J Street over there, and I'm sitting there by a desk, rewriting a whole list of a few hundred Svarim, mixing up the pages and everything, mix, everything's all mixed up. And now we had a list of the Svarim. Once we had a list of the Svarim, then I brought it to 770. I brought it to 770, so you know, the, the world headquarters of Lubavitch, the world headquarters of uh, Amazing, did not have a fax machine. Fortunately, Rabbi Yom and Klein, who lived down the block, he had a fax machine in his house. So if they had to fax anything, they would go to Yom Khan's house. So they took the list that I made, that I, the handwritten list of the whole thing, and they faxed a few places that I know. One place they faxed was to, in England. They faxed it to, um, what's his name? To Fiber Struggle. And another, that, that was in England, because the, the, the Swarim may have been ending up, ended up in England, and there was from that they ended up in England. 
and there was also a zirkind. Yeshua Shlaima. Uh, Yeshua Shlaima. That's the oldest one. He was a student in my class. The old ladies, he, okay. he became a psychologist and this and that. I don't know. But there was a time that he was in, into old Svarim. And they faxed it to these two places. And, and they had what, what to work with. That, that's how, they, they, that's how they, they were able to start to get, but maybe, maybe there would have been other ways, I don't know, long ways, you know. This was a, are we allowed to ask if you still have that list? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I gave it away. I don't have it. Mm-hmm. And then later, started the getting back of the Svarim. Now, first of all, um, he ended up taking approximately 500 Svarim. Oh. People say 400, it was approximately 500 Svarim. He did not sell 500 Svarim. He sold only 100 Svarim, or 110 Svarim, I think it was to be exact. And the rest uh, were not sold yet. So what happened was, when they had the list, that's why I heard yesterday that uh, Rabbi Krinsky was talking to Nat Lewin, and he says to him, we have a list of the Svarim, and so, so the, that's when they went to court to get a... Um, restraining a ho- order. A, rest- uh, um, a, a restraining order, an injunction, right? that he, that, uh, and, the, and, and the court the took away the Svarim from him, and they put it into bonded storage. Now, I'm not going to go into halacha, but there is a truth in the English Marchant from the Marchant that the Marchant holds that going to court to get a, 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 an injunction or is, 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 is not, it's not considered going to court. Huh. And, and what happened over there was in court Gufa, they, they said that they want the whole thing to be handled by the court. So that's why it ended up in the court. That's, uh, that. And we started working on getting back to Svarim. So um, to tell you some stories about getting, about getting back to Svarim. There were, there was another thing also. Rabbi Grona told me that the Rebbe wants, if he asked me that the Rebbe wants to know if, if, uh, if I can get a, a psak from a non Lubavitcher's love to who the Svarim belong. In other words, no. Why he wants a non Lubavitcher is obvious because you know what the Lubavitcher will pass him. Right. But you figure a non Lubavitcher can give a, a clear answer. So I said, Yeah, I do have. Who do you have? So I told him that there's an old Rav in Williamsburg who was a Rav before the war in the city of Hlein, someplace in, in Hungary. And he was known as the Hlein of the Hlein of Dayan. And he became the Dayan in Klosenberg. Right there, in their Kehilas, in the Ungarish Kehilas, the Dayan is a very popular position. Every, every place there's the Ruv and the Dayan. So he was the, the Klosen, they called him later the Klosenberg of Dayan. He lived in Williamsburg in a project on 90 Ross, 90 Ross Street. And I happened to, to know him. Uh, how did I know him? Through Katzman. Uh-huh. Katzman introduced me to him once before uh, for a different thing, uh, uh, totally unrelated. So I, I, I knew him. So I, um, I called him up and I said, I'd like to, can I come over to see you? I have a question here. So he gave me a time to come over and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to this, to this rov and everything. You know, we may have to talk in learning, talk halacha. So I figured, you know, for me to be safe, I asked Rabbi Mala to come along with me. You know, <laughs> security blanket. Yeah, and uh, we came, we came to him, and we told him the story, what happened in Lubavitch, and we told him the Rebbe would like to know a pi halacha, uh, and the Rebbe would like to have it written a pi halacha. So he listens to us, old man. He passed away a few years ago, also about the age of 90 or in the 90s. So he listened to us very carefully, very attentively. And then all he said to me was, Ni Kim Morgan. Like, he didn't want to answer on the spot, come tomorrow. And I came the next day to him, 
and uh, he prepared a little note for me. And basically what he said was a, a very simple thing. He said, as I, you know, when, when I told him the story and, and the question, you know, uh, what's the Rebbe and this and that, you know, I started telling him about Rebbe and so he said to me, look, I'm not going to get into the question of what the Rebbe is. That, that's not halacha. He said, halacha, I want to tell you, is the following. He said, there is a din when a person marries a wife and the wife has property, so the property becomes nixte mulug. Nixte mulug means, uh, it means plucking, prop- property that you pluck. What does it mean that you, what, that you pluck? It is always there's the goof of the kaka, and then there's the paytas of the kaka. So you, you, like, like you're reap, reaping the benefits. The reaping of the plucking is like reaping, the reaping of the benefits. This is, uh, uh, the husband has it, the paytas of the bulk. If a woman yashins property during her marriage, it also becomes nixen melug. Once it becomes nixen melug, so the, the goof, the, the principle, so to say, belongs to the woman, but the paytas belong to the man. It, over here by Svarim, what's the paytas of the Svarim? The paytas of the Svarim is using the Svarim. They're using the Svarim. So the din is that a woman is the owner of the property, but she's not allowed to sell it. She's not allowed to, because by selling the nifsim malug, she's depriving the husband of, of the, having the benefit. And the two husbands over here, the Rebbe and the, the, the Rashad, they're both opposing the sale. If they would agree to sell, it would be good. But being that they're both opposing it, so therefore, she, they had no right to do it. That was the, the psaq that I, I brought to, to the Rebbe. We used them also later for another very important shayla, because I started buying back, the, my cousin introduced me to a guy by the name Goldman. I don't know if anybody remembers, but on Crown Street, down by, uh, by between Brooklyn and, and Kingston, I think it was, there was a night pester of. The night pester of once printed a shas, a shas together with Nelson Garadi. And I don't know if they printed the whole shas or part of it, but they printed a shas, a partnership. They had a son that was a dealer in these old swarm. So whatever swarm, the, the, he, he had bought Swaram from Barry, and the Rebbe said that whoever has a, a, a bill of sale from him, he'll be reimbursed immediately without any question. Because what the Rebbe remember that, because there's a whole shayla if you buy from a ganif, if you have to reimburse him or not. There's a, but, but being that he, he uh, the Enigal felt he's allowed to sell it, and everybody felt that the uh, that that, um, that that they're not buying stolen goods, or they're buying something legit. So I, I paid him every safer that he gave me. I paid him right away on the spot. I paid him in cash, every safer. Because I told you for everything works in cash over there. Then later there was a problem that came up. They swore him that he sold. After he bought them. After he bought them, they swore him that he sold. So the shayla was, could he, does he have to lose the profit that he made from selling the swarm? Now, if he has to lose the profit, he has no interest in getting them back for me. If he keep, retains the profit and just returns the money to the person that bought it, but he remains with his profit, so then he'll, he'll help me. It was a big shayla. So again, we contacted and, and we agreed uh, he knew. He knew who the Halainerov was. The official has. Uh, he used to come. The official has the official. Uh, so that he knew who. So he said, "Yeah, let's ask the official." And whatever possible uh, is it. So we contacted the official, and the official said that, what I just said now. That being that he he, 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 he took it not as a ganav. He took it because he felt that it's his, and 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 nothing was ruled yet. Uh, you know, so he should keep the profit. Okay, so he, um, we, we got back another few swarm that way, and, um, and, uh, and that, that straight, and I got back from him swarm. 
Then later, I called up this guy, Idolitz, who I told you before was the... Second guy. Yeah. And I asked Idolitz, you know, since Idolitz was very cold with me. See, I don't know why, but he was cold. He doesn't know me, you know, he doesn't know who I am, you know. And I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get any words with Idolitz. Okay. Now, what happened after that, there was a note that was going around this week on, on the internet about a, an answer from the Rebbe to me. What was, what was the most with the answer from the Rebbe to me? Everyone knows that I go summer for, to, to California to raise money for Lubavitch Yeshiva. At that time, when I started in the Yeshiva, the, a number of the Rebbe's summer used to travel. Rabbi Tannenbaum used to travel to South America and to the islands, Aruba and those islands. Rabbi Garfinkel used to travel. There was a number of Rebbe's. So I, I also traveled. So I, I, my, my territory was California. So um, in fact, I, every year before I would travel, I'm just explaining what that, what that note says. Every year before I would travel, I would write the Rebbe a note that I'm, I'm planning to go to California and asking the Rebbe uh, And the Rebbe's answer always was, it's a very important thing, every, every shlu, everyone should notice. The Rebbe always answered me, it should be Bahaskomas Anash Deshon. That, so I, I interpret that to mean, that's Never how much, that it meant I, I, I would call Kunya for the to come, and I would call Fratkin for the to come to San Diego. I didn't go to San Francisco. I went to sort of just two, three people. There was no one really in, in I was Yitza, we're talking to, so I wrote the Rebbe that, um, I, I'm, I'm, here I'm getting, I'm involved. This was all around Yubes Thomas time when I would travel my, my summer vacation. I wrote the Rebbe that I'm planning to tra travel to Gamada, you know. Yes, the Rebbe Brocha. So when I wrote the, the um, to try the Fatemcha Tmimim, so the Rebbe answered, and the Siyah said, was made through the Balasvarim. So, how could you leave if you're in the middle of, and Rebbe that, that I did, and I was Zaycha, and very nice answer, and that is it's a Issa that I sent, and, 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 and told me to, to stay here. So, okay, he said, I figured the Rebbe said I should stay here, and some, something's going to happen. Now, it happens. That in this shul, the Davin the younger man. The younger man, that in this shul, his name was Richie Viner. Richie Viner lived on the next block in 240 Crown Street. He was a, a graduate of Yeshiva University, and he worked for a company called Philip Brothers. Philip Brothers was a big trading company in Manhattan, that uh, before that, uh, it had a name before that also, but it, 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 he worked for this company, and uh, he used to dive in here, here, here in Shul, and he would always tell me that he's looking forward to retire, he was a young guy, looking forward to retire, and he thinks he'll retire after January. So I said to him, Richie, why are you looking forward to retire and why Dafka after January? So he says to me, he told me that in his company there's a lot of Yidin working over there and uh, there's big bonuses in December. So after he gets the bonuses, so I said, so what will you do when you retire? He says, I want to sit and learn. So uh, I said, you know, Richie, what do you have to retire? Remain working and let's make a chavrusa together. Let's learn together. So he said, Rabbi, you'll sit and learn with me? I said, yeah. So we made up that we would learn together. And every Wednesday night, either I would come to his house over there. We alternated. Or he would come to my house and we'd sit and learn Gemara for two hours. Everyone. But here I am, the neighborhood over here started changing. And uh, he decided... He, he, he can't live anymore in this neighborhood. So he went to, to Mansi and he put down a, 
uh, uh, the person ends up buying a house. He calls me up and says to me, Rabbi, I couldn't live here anymore. I had to move. I have a doubt, but I want to remain learning with you. So he said, I have an idea. I would, I learn, I, live, I work in the uh, Philip Brothers. And maybe you, you're a Lubavitcher. You like to, this is exactly what he said to me. You, you like to do, you know, work, you know, to, Maybe I'll arrange that there'll be a shear to Philip Brothers, that you'll come to give a shear, and I'll arrange the shear. I said, I said, good, you got it. So for eight years, I gave a shear in this company called Philip Brothers, who was the owner of Philip Brothers. At one time, it was a man by the name Bentheim. Bentheim's big, big Gevirim from the Breuer Kehila, and a partner was Ludwig, Ludwig Jesselson. Ludwig Jesselson is a, was the president of Sharet Tzedek Hospital in Ertes, so very, very big of him. And I think two times when, they, when they, so they moved offices from one place to the other, Jesselson himself came to the Shia. So I got to know, I got to know Jesselson. So um, now Jesselson, besides being a big Gevir, is also a Swarm collector. Yeah. <laughs> so I called him up and I told him the story and uh, what happened in Lubavitch. And I said, by any chance, did you buy any of those Swarm? He said, look, I don't know, but if you have a list, send me the list and I'll, I'll get back to you. I sent him a list and he, he got back to me. He called me and said, look, I went over the list he says, uh, did you get back this safer? Did you get, he listed a few of the very valuable ones. He said, if you, he said I don't recall buying any, anything from this list, but if you got back this list, let the, tell the Rebbe to be happy. <laughs> you, you know, you, like you got, you got back. most the, of them back there. Okay, good, ones. okay. now going a, a, step, a step further, um, he, uh, he I mentioned before that there was a, a the, the list that I got was faxed to Fibers Vogel in England. So in England, there was a year, a, a year also, a big year, but I think the name was Jack Lunza, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Huh? You right? Is it Jack Lunza? That he bought Swarum. And Vogel got back those Swarum thanks to the list, and it got back those Swarum. But so happens that one, uh, I think, I, I don't remember the detail right now, but something, I must have spoken to, to Vogel and told him, mentioned him something about Jesselson. And, 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 and I found out that Jesselson, you see, Jesselson, just like people, you know, that, that, that want to do exercise, have a trainer. So people that have a library that want to collect for them have a buyer. They have their buyer. Who's Jesselson's buyer? Okay. Adelitz. Oh, the guy that didn't want to help want to talk to you. Yeah, the guy that didn't want to talk to me. And I, so I mentioned it. I mentioned it, I think, to Vogel. If, if I remember correct, I think I mentioned it to Vogel. This Lonza has a daughter in Manhattan, also a very rich lady. And she called up her father. If, if, I, remember, if I remember correct, maybe I'm not exactly over there. And we'll play up between Gonza and, uh, and, and Jesselson. I get a call from Idolitz. Uh, on the Eagle yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, how are you? I want to help you, you know, so that. Now, the problem was, how do you deal now? How do you deal with, with this, like I said before, how do you deal with this forum? He, he, um, the, the, the problem was that he bought the Svarim from second hand. In other words, in the case of Goldman, Goldman, Goldman bought Svarim from the Einikel, and Goldman sold it. So it was he one... He knew who he bought it from. But over here was, he either was bought from a dealer that bought from the Einikel, mm -hmm. and he sold it to another person, so there's a third hand already. You know, how do we deal over here with the... the with the, the commissions price, and everything. Price, yeah. yeah. So the Rebbe said, 
that in case where there's no uh, no uh, no documents to go by, you should go to a rov, and the rov should paskin that everything is uh, is eluch. In other, the rov should confirm it. If the rov confirms it, so okay, that, that, so I I I went to. Um, Idolists, I don't remember, oh, indeed, I got to look at the book I wrote, but uh, Idolists Lepoil told me that I asked him, who's your Rav? He says his Rav is Rabbi Nasha Klein. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there was one cipher that he, that, he, that he got back from me. I don't remember exactly which cipher it was and the amount of money, but I went to Rabbi Nasha Klein. Rabbi Nasha Klein knows me, knows me also, knew me, uh, and uh, he gave a note that these people came to me, and uh, and he signed it very nicely to the Rebbe. I mean, you know, we had a, a good yachas with the Rebbe. And, but the main thing is, he called me one, the idolist called me a second time, that he has another cipher. The other cipher, he said, is what's called an Amsterdam Haggadah. Now, I gotta explain something about, about Haggadahs. Today, you know, there's, there's girls' schools, Beshaka, Beshara, Beshifka, whatever you have, you know. Years ago, many years ago, the wealthy people, the wives, were illiterate. They knew nothing. So what they, do is, uh, what they would do is they would have an artist that would make Haggadah with pictures, and they gave it a present to the wife, and they would sit by the Seder and discuss the pictures. So, you know, and depending on who the, the artist was, you know, that's how, the value of, so this, okay, excuse me a minute. One. So depending who the artist was, was uh, contingent on, on, on the value of, of the Agoda. She says he has Agoda. He bought this Agoda from the Enoch, not, 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 the Enoch sold the Agoda for $1,700. The one who bought it sold it to Idolus for $4,700. <laughs> and Idolus sold it to a third party for $5,200. How long did I go? <laughs> okay. So um, he says to me, if you, if you want, uh, I can get that Agoda back to you, but it'll have to cost you. I said, no problem. So we made up that we'll meet by uh, Menashe Klein. This was the second meeting by Menashe Klein. And uh, he, he gave a note that we came together to him, a very nice note, and he signed his name and his mother's name when he signed the, the, the note of the Lebanon. And then at the, afterwards he says to me, Ich verstein it. Ich verstein it, he says. I'll, I'll say it in English. Five thousand two hundred dollars for Hagoda? I can't understand that. How? how who pays five thousand two hundred for Hagoda? So I said to him, I said, to him, "Oh, let them make a minion in the back. You mind to sit and learn from it?" Yeah. So I said to him, "Well, make, make sure we have a minion here." Yeah, I think we have a minion. So I said to him, "Rabbi Klein, you think that's a lot of money?" There was a Hagoda that sold for $150,000. Right. <laughs> What's the mice with Hagoda with $150,000? There was a Hagoda called the Kitsi Hagoda. Kitsi was an artist. And he made a few Hagodas that, that, are, that are in circulation. And there was a year in, I think, in Switzerland or, or in so one of these countries over there that is a collector. And he had three of his Hagodas. Original. Yeah, when he heard that there's a fourth Hagoda available, some dealer really knew who, who's His looking for it, yeah. and he paid $150,000 to get the Agoda. The end was there's a Rosenfeld over there, someplace uh, in Europe. Yeah, in Switzerland. Yeah, in Switzerland. He's, he, got, he ended up getting back. So when I said to him that there was a God that, uh, a God that sold for $150,000, he says to me, Wus, $150,000 for Agoda? Mestame paret kechas mit sein Namen Yeah. <laughs>
You want to hear more? We're here. Why not? Yeah, okay. Okay. This is we're not hearing everywhere else. This is the behind the scenes. Stories. Yeah. Now, now, let, now let me tell you two things. People ask me if in my book that I wrote about the, the story of, of hey, tell you, so getting back to Swatham, is there anything else that you didn't put in there. that I didn't put in there? I said yes. There was. He says, what is it? So it's the following story. And it's the gate to something else where I uh, dispute another one of the so-called simchas in Lubavitch. Oh, yeah. but, but, but people want to pervert uh, history. If, if the, he ended up selling, the Einikol ended up selling the Swadim for a total of a hundred, about $150,000, maybe a hundred, forty, hundred, fifty, some, some was in that area. It cost Lubavitch, and my, my purchases, and other purchases, uh, what's his name, Vogel and Zirkin, it cost Lubavitch over $400,000 wow. to get back to Swatim. Did we get them all back? Almost all. Mm -hmm. Now what do I mean almost all? Uh, there's a few, you have to realize that there's, there's um, like I say, he sold about 100 Swatim, 110 Swatim, I think. The Swatim, I forgot to say this in the beginning. The, the, not only was there not a, a list available of, 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 of what was in the library or right. what was taken, but there was no proof in the Swatim that they belonged to the library. Uh -huh. Today, if you go up to the library, every safe has a stamp in it. Uh -huh. At that time, there was nothing in the Swatim. So there's certain swarm that he took that are not, were not so valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a number of uh, c copies of it. You know, there's certain, the there's certain swarm that as you see, uh, uh, Kata Matthias, there's only one copy, you know, available. So it, it's hard to trace it down. Did I buy this from him? Did I buy? So there's a few swarm that, that I think were not retrieved. To, to, that, that's what I remember when I, when I wrote the, the story. But what happened was, after everything was over, after the judge gave his decision, and there was an appeal, he appealed it, and, won. and the appeal court was again in favor, upheld the, the decision of the judge. Then there were some hotheads in Lubavitch decided, now it's that decided, the now we're gonna sue him for the money. He didn't have the money. They're going to sue him for the money. For the 400. Yeah, for the 400. Uh, uh, so in order to sue him for the money, you have to compile a list of everything that was bought back and how much was paid for everything that was bought back. We had no receipts for that. No, 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 no. Uh, every, no, so I told you, either you had the receipts from him or you had, you had from the dealers, I mean, uh, uh -huh. or from the Rav, you know. But everything that was bought back, you, had, you, you compiled a list of everything. And it came to, let's say, 440, I'm giving a number, $442,000. So, no, no, okay, one, one more, let, let me tell you one more thing. I spent money. I spent money, it was my money, and all cash. But Rabbi Chadikov will not give me back cash. <laughs> he insists on giving me a check. Okay? So the marshal, uh, I gave him a, a bill of everything that I spent, and he gave me a check, and he paid me. So Battle Levine put together all the money that Chadakov gave checks, and this one gave checks, and, 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 and how much each safe cost. So after everything was calculated, 